Thank you very much. I'd now like to welcome Professor Stanislav Krajewski, Professor of Philosophy at the Institute of Philosophy, University of Warsaw, Poland. Um, Professor Krajewski is also co-chair of the Polish Council of Christians and Jews. He is also co-author of the core exhibition of the Museum of the History of Jews in Warsaw. So I'm going to speak about the, this depth that has been already mentioned several times by my predecessors. So this is not a very clear uh, concept, and it has never been developed by Heschel in a comprehensive way. And perhaps the reason is that, I quote, depth theology deals with acts which precede articulation and defy definition. It is preconceptual. So it would seem that it can be only, we can only allude to it indicate, describe it metaphorically. But, well, you know, you may think that it's something wrong, but let me tell you that this is the case with many other important concepts, not just in theology, even in science. For example, when you, most of the basic concepts are somehow derived from fundamental human experience, even in science. For example, the concept of energy in physics. We know what it is because of our human experiences. Of course, in physics, then it functions as a technical term and is used in a technical way, but still, this is the way we can understand what it's this all about at all. Or in mathematics, when we have the concept of a set. Sets are, you know, we can, from sets you can cons uh, construct the whole, of the whole realm of what mathematics does, uh, in which mathematics lives, so to say, the modern mathematics. But what is a set? You know, when we collect a few things together, we think about this as a set of things, or something like this. So those <coughs> basic uh, human experiences are always the basis, the, the source, of even our more uh, sophisticated and even most uh, uh, technical uh, ideas. And so, no wonder, this is also the case in uh, theology. Uh, so, the idea of depth theology, which let me believe, let me, let me uh, uh, repeat this, uh, is that while, the th while theology uh, is dealing with believing, with the content of believing, the depth theology, says Heschel, deals with the act of believing. Its pur I, I quote, its purpose being to explore the depth of faith, the substratum out of which belief arises. So it is about an event, individual experience, resides in the heart, etc. Uh, so, of course, this is difficult to grasp. It's, uh, you know, it's momentary, uh, it's like music which really lasts when you listen to it and disappears a, m a, moment, a moment later. And theology, on the other hand, which is a certain system, something constructed, expressed, is like sculpture, says Heschel. So it's more tangible, more objective. Uh, well, but and both are necessary. Now, the problem which already was mentioned by Professor Meir is whether when Heschel says the religion, whether he really, really means something that is uh, that applies to both Judaism and Christianity and Islam and Buddhism and every and all, all the other at least major religions, it's not clear. Especially when he says that what is faith? Faith is an act of the whole person person that is the consent to God somehow. So when the term God is used in whatever definition, then of course you must, we must ask what is meant by God. And I, of course Heschel was aware of that, uh, that you know, when we, we talk about this, we have about God, we have to refer to the whole tradition of understanding the term. So it's not a certain abstract term or something that can be just used you know, without uh, reference to very deep and and a uh, comprehensive tradition of understanding the term. That's why Merkel, in his book about Heschel, John Merkel, said that, you know, that, that, uh, uh, that while, while he 
said that this uh, that that his his system is like an effort to make an apologia for vita sua that you know we, we should say for perhaps it's apologia for vita judaica uh, and what i want to say is is perhaps an apologia for vita interreligiosa so the idea is that uh, you know interreligious realm the interreligious exchange interfaith relations are certainly a very important point of uh, departure for Heschel uh, and as he said it was already quoted that that why theologies divide us depth theology unites us uh, now one can try could try to describe interreligious dialogue in a more say fundamental or theoretical way and I think one can attempt to do that Mo, uh, in a way that would be modeled on on the idea of depth theology so while uh, whereas the you know that theme of the depth theology is the act of believing the very act of believing i think that we can define the depth interfaith dialogue theology or say the deep dialogue if you want about uh, the idea of the deep dialogue as being about the very act of interreligious dialoguing so here is the act of believing here is the act of interreligious dialoguing so to say so while uh, a similarly while depth theology is to explore the depth of faith the substratum out of which belief arises so they quoted already, the purpose of depth interfaith dialogue theology would be to explore this deep interfaith dialogue, the layer of interreligious encounter that defines it as a special event, an event or experience that cannot be found elsewhere. Now, does it exist, this, 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 this source, this special sort of e encounter? So I think it does, and this is my assumption like you know with theology or depth theology for those who deny the religious realm god or transcendence you know this all those considerations don't make sense so though for those who deny those special uh, dimension of interfaith uh, encounters also though the uh, idea of the the attempt to describe it doesn't make sense so i am assume that this does make sense so this is my point of departure so it's not easy to say to try to describe to, to 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 describe to isolate the characteristics of the deep interfaith dialogue uh, let me mention uh, one uh, similarly as is the case was the case with this depth theology uh, Heschel's depth theology th this deep dialogue can be only momentary so uh, as Heschel wrote we cannot be in rapport with the reality of the divine except for rare fugitive moments uh, and uh, I think the situation with interreligious encounter is uh, similar that this deep relationship is only momentary and uh, this can occur if you know the attitude the mutual mutual attitudes of absolute respect to dialogue partner are present or Heschel talked about reverence this already has al also been mentioned a rev reverence for the person of the person of another religiosity or other religion uh, um, Martin Buber has been talking as we know uh, what talked about perceiving the other as uh, though all those things are all those uh, ideas are well known, but I think they are really appro uh, appropriate here to, to, in the, in to uh, try to understand what is happening. But of course, to be sure, real life dialogue, real life encounters are rarely deep in this sense, in the sense that this is only a momentary uh, situation that can appear. Usually what we call dialogue is, you know, any sort of exchange, debate, negotiation, quarrels, you know, um, uh, exchanges of information, etc. Now, if we think that there is something like a deep dialogue, 
So what would be it, what would we contrast it with? Like we have deep depth theology and theology on the other hand. Here we have this deep dialogue, and what is on the other hand? Pro presumably a shallow dialogue, which uh, would mean many useful things and many things that are, are otherwise important and can be very constructive, like learning from the other or about the other, teaching the other, discussing, debating, or negotiating. In various situations, that's okay. But I think all those encounters remain shallow if there is no moment or dimension that can be described in those Buberian or Heschelian uh, terms as, as the, the, the though or reverence. In another way that I'm proposing to describe the, the, the issue is to consider the, the possible outcomes of those interfaith encounters. So what could be the outcomes? Very roughly. It can be an increase of knowledge, one or another kind of knowledge. Another outcome can be a compromise, that's some sort of you know, compromised state, co statement that is somehow uh, you know, common because there some compromises have been made. Another would be a victory of one side, which means a defeat of the other side. And interestingly, I think that in all cases, increase of knowledge, compromise, victory and defeat, there is something, you know, an increase of something which is in common to both partners of dialogue. Either the knowledge is becomes b bigger or common principles are agreed upon or uh, a common ground, even if only because one of the sides prevailed. And this can be useful or in various uh, ways, of course, uh, but I think that the important point is that it, there can be another type of outcome when no increase of anything occurs. That is, there's no effect really. The outcome is no outcome. And of course, this can be uh, d due to just the complete failure of, uh, of uh, no communication at all. But, and this is my point of actually, that this can be also the result of uh, any lack of the, any lack of expectation, of the lack of any expectations to win, to achieve a compromise, and even to learn. That is, it would be, you know, treating the other as really a though, putting the relation about above the selves of the partners so nothing to be expected no it's an interfaith religion uh, interreligious di di encounter so nothing uh, relating to the religion or religi religiosity of the other person is being expected everything is just received in an open manner so this is my proposal to call this deep dialogue or genuine dialogue, uh, interfaith dialogue, uh, to call it deep if it includes moments in which the encounter is intentionally aimless. Of course, one can uh, argue that uh, that looks nice, but but other, uh, after all, you know, this means that you know there is some sort of mutuality that is. Uh, assumed like openness and trust or both sides and all those things. So there are some expectations. Uh, even in that uh, dimension that I I'm trying to describe. But I would argue that they are second order requirements or meta requirements if you wish. And both my predecessors used the term meta in some way. So I'm doing th that too. The who which uh, so this has nothing to do with the religious views, attitudes, opinions, practices, beliefs of the other side. It just has to do with the quality of the encounter itself. Okay, so of course this is an idealized description and it's only a momentary uh, fleeting aspect of any real life encounter, if at all. Uh, Heschel has not developed the any real theory of interreligious encounters, although he 
that uh, you know was not only involved but he really cared about that there are other authors who did say something so just very briefly martin buber whom i already uh, mentioned um, perhaps the most important uh, theoretician is raimundo panikar who distinguished between the, what he called the dialogical dialogue and the dialectical dialogue dialectic dialogue is like exchanging arguments the dialogical dialogue is something more or less what I'm trying to describe, where it's dialogue not about something, some su subject matter, it's a dialogue about themselves. They, as he wrote, Panikar, they dialogue themselves. Uh, there are other ideas, for example, uh, David Bohm, a physicist, a major, major physicist who no, it was not an interfaith setting at all, but he produced a certain type of encounters in which a group of people are sitting together and nothing, nothing is expected from them. Uh, just whatever is happening will be happening and some result will follow. So it's also s similar. Levinas has said something about Christian Jewish encounters that is really also going in the same direction, very interestingly. No, but no, very few people think about Levinas when thinking about interfaith dialogue. So he said that those new encounters have a certain new quality that is uh, a new, s a quote, a new spirituality, proximity with no predefined goals, sans projet défini, and things like that. Now, an important point I want to make is that <coughs> when we <coughs> try to refer or to use this traditional philosophy of dialogue or dialogics a la Buber, it's not enough. Because basically Buber is, Buber's theory is about interhuman encounter, not interfaith encounter. Uh, of course, he, his main source or perhaps examples of encounters are interfaith actually, but not only, of course, and it's not enough. So, my, so the general thing is to, there's some extension needed of the dialogics, and this extension really is, is to take into account something. So the partner of dialogue is to be approached, or per not perceived really, but approached or related to, not as a person only, but as a person together with his or her religiosity, religion, which of course evokes a whole large uh, realm of, reli of one's religiosity. So one way of doing that in this in the grammatical way, you know, like it's I though, I it, I think it would be to do it, it, to try to develop something which would, could be called I, you, I, the plural you. So it's not I vis-a-vis -vis the other person, it is this, yes, but also this other person is it as, as this person's community is like the counterpart in the, in, the, the, in the dialogue. Can it be developed? Because it needs some abstraction, something that both Levinas and Buber didn't really want to in this case. I think th there is no other way if we try to develop this along those ways. And the last thing I want to say is that is the question whether you know the fact that some of that um, all of those authors, with the important exception of Panikar, uh, were Jewish, and I didn't choose them because they were Jews. I chose them because they were most helpful in trying to understand what was going on in this deep interfaith dialogue, whether this is essential or not. And I think there are some elements of the Jewish tradition that are uh, helpful. Oh. And uh, so uh, perhaps the main thing is, and that's perhaps also would, would somehow connect me to the previous talk of Dr. Haber, is that you know, the stress on orthopraxis, ortho or on doing things properly, rather than orthodoxy, on, b on believing things uh, properly, is very helpful, because this is really something that can be it ma ma makes you know inter-religious encounter much easier because you know I do something you know I don't eat pork he eats pork but it's there is no contradiction here and uh, and uh, while the if the beliefs or opinions are taken into account or dogmas 
and one dogma contradicts the other dogma, we have a much more severe problem. So I think this is a very important uh, way, way of, you know, overcoming some of the uh, contradictions to see whether they relate to behavior rather than to opinions as such. And whatever, uh, whatever, uh, however Judaism or the Jewish tradition or the motives of Jew uh, in the Jewish tradition can be helpful uh, or not, I think that all those thinkers that I have mentioned, Levinas, uh, Buber, and especially Herschel, and especially his intuition of depth theology, uh, is, uh, will remain as a very m a major point of reference in uh, such a work. And I hope that this his Heschel's idea of depth theology can hopefully also be extended to help exploring other areas as well. Thank you.